Total War Rome 2 released a new edition of the game called the Caesar Edition, and it's out now. If you're looking to buy the game and get the best value, use my affiliate link in the description, and you can get it on CD Keys for 70% cheaper than on Steam, and greatly support the channel in the process. Divide et Impera is the best mod I've played for a Total War game in the last five years. I covered it a long time ago and praised it for its grounded take on battles and deeper unit recruitment systems. It was a good mod, but now, it's excellent. It elevates Rome 2 to a whole new level, it gives the game meaningful depth, and increases immersion and replayability. What's arguably most impressive of all is that the AI can actually handle the mod, and is much more challenging as a result of the mechanics placed on the player without it feeling unfair. This is not to be underestimated. Typically, overambitious mods will have cool ideas, but the AI is still stuck playing the game they were designed for. As a result, the challenge dissipates and it becomes overly apparent that it was never meant to be this way. With DEI, it brings Rome 2 as close as possible to the vision I think most fans of the series had in mind, while still being playable and fun. I'm going to break this mod down into its components of its major features. I'll cover each one and how it affects gameplay. If you want to know how to download the mod, I've posted a link to my website with a full description of what to do. It takes about one minute to read and it takes even less if you know what you're doing. It's very quick. It's worth mentioning at the top that DEI team is led by Dresden, and the mod has always been updated immediately after Creative Assembly patched their game. Even now, five years after the release of Rome 2, after many have come and gone on the project, Dresden is still updating the mod for us for free. Because of the file size limit on Rome 2's Steam Workshop, he's had to buy the game several times due to the fact that he needs multiple accounts to upload all the parts of the mod. It's a crying shame that he has to do this and that a mod with over 100,000 subscribers, Creative Assembly haven't provided him with everything he needs and more for the continued development of that mod. Now should you wish to support his team and his efforts, he has a Patreon that will help fund the development of the mod. His goal is not to become a full-time modder, but he told me that it would be a dream come true if he could. So send him some much deserved support if possible. The mechanics I'm about to show you in this video are extremely deserving of more attention and far more praise than the humble Dresden would like to expose himself to. So let's begin. Number one is population. In DEI, every region within every province has its own population. Sounds like the good old days of Rome 1, right? Well, sort of. DEI takes it further and introduces a class system on top of the population. There's first class, second class, third class, and a fourth foreigner class. The names of these change depending on the faction. For instance, the Romans described their population classes as the nobles, the plebs, and the proletarii. The Egyptians called them something else entirely, but it's just historical flavor. The class system is the same for all. So how does this population system manifest itself in gameplay? Well, when recruiting a unit, they draw from your population. Population is manpower. Now, depending on the unit, they'll draw from a different class of population. For the early Roman Republic, cavalry were often noblemen who could afford a horse. So, if you want to draft a unit like Equites, not only are they expensive, but they must come from the nobility class. Nobles are, you know, hard to come by, which means elite units are more hard to come by. And if a unit takes casualties and you don't have the appropriate population to replenish them, they won't replenish. If you were to conquer a region in the neighboring land, the population there would convert to foreigners. After all, they're foreign to you. This slows down the advancement of your empire considerably. You can't simply keep pushing and replenishing in your own territory. You'll either have to tread back to your own population centers or consider recruiting foreigner armies with foreign units. We'll touch on that soon. The system is quite dynamic. If you recruit a thousand plebs from Rome, march them to Aretium and disband them, the city of Aretium will receive 1,000 new plebs. In that regard, you can mass migrate populations, though it is obviously expensive to do, and I've never needed to do it, but it's an example of how flexible the system is. There's a series of buildings and effects that will encourage or hinder the growth of population. There's also a sort of finite cap to how big it gets before the overcrowding kicks in and slows it back down. Expanding towns and increasing their level will increase this overcrowding cap. In this regard, you cannot just wait until you have 100,000 population and then just disregard the feature. It'll hit a cap long before that and require upgrading, so it's really well thought out. Now, while the UI isn't terribly pretty, it is functional and in-depth. You can see a province's total population, and you can check each region to see the breakdown of the classes, the settlement growth, and the contributing factors to each individual class growth. Certain types of buildings will attract and encourage different classes of population. There's even immigration buildings that encourages foreigners to come to the city. This will bring with it a negative to your culture, but more foreigners means more exotic units. And again, we'll discuss that in our next feature. 
The population system adds a much more grounded feel to the game. You know where your people come from. You care when they die, because they are finite. You can't get all the units you want and are encouraged to diversify. Here's an example of the mechanic at play in my recent campaign. I sailed across to Illyria, waged war and captured towns. My armies were largely made up of principes and missile troops, which are plebs and proletarii. When I captured the towns, I couldn't replenish. The new territories were all foreigners. I had to sail back to Italy and wait for several turns. This divided my armies and I kept getting cut down or pushed back by overwhelming numbers. I'm a veteran of this game and it took me about 40 turns to capture Illyria after two failed invasions. Once my foothold was established, I built grain pits for replenishment and a municipium colony, which encouraged growth of our second and third classes. With a base of operations then established, it didn't take long before we finally pushed back the various tribes and factions and took all of Pannonia. We still ran out of population here regularly, but it was at least a lot more manageable now. All this because I dared to cross the sea for a coastal invasion instead of a connected land expansion to somewhere much closer by. It was awesome. Now another way around it would be to sacrifice the quality of my principes and raise local Illyrian troops, which brings me to the next feature. Number 2. Area of Recruitment In DEI, certain units can only be recruited in certain places. Practically every province has an average of around 4 units unique to that location and sometimes as many as 10. These are not mercenaries, they're considered area of recruitment units and are denoted by a little flag on their unit icons. Any faction can recruit them and they always come from the foreigner class of the population. This adds a huge amount of personality to the world and diversity to your armies. As you progress and expand you'll find more units to utilize both low and high tier. And as mentioned previously, depending on your population limits you might need to recruit them and utilize foreign armies. Or you might want them but there isn't many foreigners left to recruit from in that province. Another issue is that you can only recruit your core units so long as you have the dominant culture in the province. Again, this makes expansion difficult and casualties a lot more impactful. You cannot recruit legionaries from a Greek dominated culture, for example. In a campaign I have with Jackie Fish, he's been playing as Rome and lately I've seen him fielding hoplites and Greek shock cavalry in Gaul. These are units he's been recruiting from Massalia or from Sicily that he's been transporting north. Sometimes it's just cool seeing that these units are such a long way from home and sometimes they have a big impact on gameplay. As Egypt taking territories in Ethiopia, it gave me access to an array of savage axemen with armor penetration twice that of all the other units I have. Some would say it's perfect for Romans. Now, not all units are available to all factions. Different army reforms allow them to raise different units over time, and it doesn't stop there. There's also a robust mercenary map that functions similarly to the area of recruitment map, but any faction at any time can get these units. Like traditional mercenaries, they're expensive and highly specialized. They also cost foreigner population from the region. Lastly, the Romans have a specific auxiliary recruitment map. This is much wider in scale and less specific, usually denoting large cultural areas for units. It of course requires an auxiliary barracks to be built in the outlined areas on the map guide and then recruits from the po foreigner population. A great example of this is Syracuse. This city with an auxiliary barracks gives recruitment to Cretan archers and Spartan hoplites. You don't need to own Greece to get them but having a barracks in a place that shared their culture historically and is close by allows you to do it. Similarly placing one in Lilybaeum gives access to a host of African troops. Now after different reform levels for the Romans, you'll start to be able to recruit much more province specific legionaries. There's literally around 50 of them, so you can definitely make very specific armies that came from very specific places. For me, I'm not a big stats guy, but I love the fact that you could create Cohors Thebiorum from Egypt and travel east to Parthia, and you can always tell at a glance where they came from and their journey. Number 3, Reforms. I've mentioned reforms a couple of times now. Each culture group has their own set of military reforms in DEI. These largely happen due to your Imperium level and the turn number, but for the AI, they just require the turn number, so hopefully they still put up the challenge with better troops later on in the game, even if they're not that big of a nation. You'll get a message about when this happens for each culture just in case you wanted to know about it. Military reforms are basically a way of introducing new unit upgrades and units at certain campaign milestones. The units, they're not always better, directly. Sometimes they offer more armor but less attack or something along those lines. The reforms can also change the class of population from which the unit comes from. For instance, with the Marian reforms for the Romans, principes who came from the plebs will in turn upgrade to legionaries who come from the proletarii. This is to denote the historical change of the army loosening its rules about who can join and issuing their own state equipment. You're now able to field better, albeit more expensive troops, from a wider pool of people. It's a pretty big deal when it happens. 
These turn times and Imperium requirements are different for most factions, this gives a really nice incentive to continue playing to get more units and upgrade your armies overall. There's not much more to it than that, it's just a fantastic feature. Number 4. Supply Divide et Impera features a supply system for armies and navies. This can get quite complicated, but I'll try to give a simplified rundown of the basics behind it. Essentially, each region in the game has a certain amount of supplies that the armies and navies consume. Supplies are stored in regions. Each region has a base supply storage limit, and the fertility of that region increases or decreases this. So, a region in Italy that's fertile can support a lot more supplies than a region in Africa that isn't, typically. Now, buildings such as farms and ports contribute to this supply, filling up the stockpile, and supply depot buildings increase the storage limit and extend the reach of the supply across multiple regions, essentially giving you a sort of supply line effect. So, for instance, an army marching in home territory will usually be taking supplies from a nearby port or farm or something like that. If you have a lot of armies in one place, they may consume more than the region produces, and over time you'll eventually run out and begin taking attrition. It's pretty rare that this happens in home territory, but if there's a situation where you have two or three armies piled up together, and the enemy are also in the region consuming supplies, or possibly even raiding, it can deplete really quickly. So I mentioned a supply line effect, and this is essentially a way of extending your supply into nearby regions. A supply depot will extend your supply by three regions, allowing you to march into enemy territory but keep your armies supplied. They'll continue drawing from the region and this will increase the global logistics level, which can in turn increase the upkeep of all armies. So essentially, if you think in practical terms, the further you venture out with more armies, the more transporting via supply line you're doing and the more the army is costing you. The stats themselves can be a little bit overwhelming, but if you think about it like that a little bit more practically, it just makes sense. When supplies get depleted or you venture too far from a nearby depot, then you'll begin foraging in the local area and depleting the local supplies rapidly. If you're in a desert or alpine area during summer or winter, this can mean that foraging just isn't even an option, and you'll immediately take attrition. This goes even further when you consider that civilized, barbarian, and nomadic nations all handle supply a little bit differently to make them better in their local terrain. A new baggage train unit also exists that allows you to consume less supplies on the go, but the other penalties still exist. Lastly, ships also obey by supply, but it's much more simple. Ships at sea have 8 turns to return to a port before their supply is diminished, and if they carry a supply ship unit with them, they can supply nearby armies and transport armies without any attrition penalty. So when invading the coast of Illyria, I needed my fleet near the coast to keep my armies well supplied, as I had multiple armies across the sea in foreign lands that would have, you know, needed to be foraging all the time, but they were running out of food very quickly because of the enemy armies that were there as well. One region was trying to support four or five armies at a time, and food was just running out. It's still a bit of a confusing system because of all the UI to kind of understand what's going to be next turn or what's going on exactly, but the practicality of it is just great. In my campaign with Jackie, our head-to-head, -head, I cannot just sail to Rome with a few fleets and transports because they'll run out of supply and essentially wind up dead before they even get there. There's also the fact that transports increase global logistics for supply by a huge amount, making the journey extremely costly. It's really a great addition to the game, and a great addition to the set of buildings that you can build. You can almost ignore the feature 60 or 70% of the time, but when you're pushing deeper into enemy territory or really making a dash for something far off, you will start to feel it, especially if the weather hasn't been kind to you in, this, in that particular season. Number 5. Combat Combat in DEI has a slower pace to it than vanilla. The scale of the units are increased, and the time to kill is reduced from the front. When a unit begins taking about 30% casualties give or take the type of unit, its morale will start to break. If it's hit in the rear, the morale penalty is huge. Now, Unit cohesion and formations have been changed around, with distinctions between the training of the troops. Cheap and numerous troops are often more spread out and loose, whilst well-trained, more expensive troops are much more robust and stay together. There's also a few handy additions to the battles in DEI. Most notably, there's an ability that almost all missile units can use called Concentrate Fire. It allows you to target the ground instead of a specific unit. This comes in so handy when archers struggle to line up or fire on units in streets or with strange formations, but you can just target a blob of troops and fire into it. Units all have an associated stamina trait to them now, which governs how fast the unit tires and regains fatigue 
both in movement and in combat. This varies on the type of the unit, with heavy units tying much quicker and light units being much more agile. There is also a little bit of crossover depending on the training of the unit. Romans may be heavy infantry, but their stamina is still quite good because they're so disciplined. Pikes and phalanx have had a major rework. Now, when in pike formation, a unit will hold its ground and never move. If you single right-click a unit, they will advance until they engage and then they'll hold, again, never moving. If you double right-click a unit, they'll take a couple of steps forward, dealing more casualties to the enemy unit, but extending deeper into the battle lines. The penalty to the being flanked in a phalanx is unbelievably huge, so when advancing, you have to make sure you're not exposing your sides or rear. It's perfect for street combat, not so good for open land battles where there's big lines involved and maybe the unit next to you just kind of edges in around your side. There's also several new traits and formations to use for trained soldiers to keep them together, some of which are passive effects constantly there, and some that are toggled on or off. Overall, I'm really growing to love the combat in DEI. I used to feel like it was perhaps a little bit too slow, and generally it still can be if two spears are just facing off on a wall, but I think morale is done in a great way where if you do get behind the enemy, you can break them and roll them up very quickly. When it comes to my multiplayer sessions with Jackie, the battles can often feel quite fast-paced against a human, with a lot of managing to do. Against the AI, it's never going to be as good, obviously, and they are prone to breaking their formations in phalanx at times because of this new system, which is probably honestly the worst offense of the mod in terms of how it plays, that sometimes the AI might shield wall and then just rotate 90 degrees or push at weird angles with them. But generally speaking, the battles still feel much more grounded and atmospheric to me and can still be quite challenging. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the plethora of units and models at your disposal. You don't come across carbon copy armies and the color palette feels a lot more worn and realistic. Number six, characters. Characters in DEI actually don't see too much of a change than what you'd be used to with the addition of the family tree. However, the mod runs at four turns per year, so each turn is three months, which means your characters typically live quite a long time. In fact, it might be a little bit too long as 200 turns is about the time your first generation of characters will start dying. That being said, it did take me about 100 turns just to capture 12 regions, so maybe it is all fine. Either way, you can tweak it with a submod if you like, and I think for me personally, two turns per year is the sweet spot, even though seasons don't really fit the game that way, um, but it's still fine. Now, characters do have an overhauled progression system. Now there's seven categories to upgrade your character into if you want to specialize them. You have camp administrator for improving the costs and experience of the army, a capable bureaucrat, which is great for maintaining province. He could be a commander of men, which is all about morale and movement and so on and so forth. There's four others. It's again, really practical application of the upgrades and it's easy to figure out what your general is at a glance. Oh, he's a camp administrator. Like I just know that he makes the army run a little bit better. Or he's a ferocious warrior. Guess what? He's probably pretty good at fighting. Then there's also a bunch of new traits, retinue types, and a bunch of new items. One of my generals in my Egypt campaign carries the Sword of Alexander, which gives him a bunch of combat buffs and inspires the men. So while characters are still a far cry from the good old days, you will recognize and care about them just a little bit more, and with the family tree, they're much easier to keep track of now too. Number seven, diplomacy and AI. The last thing I want to touch on is diplomacy and the AI on the campaign. Now as someone with a little bit of experience in how games are made, I know that AI cannot actually be changed by modders. They don't have access to the code or the search algorithms used, but they do have access to the weights applied to some of the decision making. Now whatever Dresden and his team here have done, whether by chance or not, has greatly enhanced the AI in my opinion. They build really good armies that are varied and have experience. They very rarely, if ever, take attrition or starve. When they're beaten down, they ask to be client stated. When they wage war, they actually take towns on their borders and progress. When under threat, they move and react to it, instead of letting their empire just erode away while they push in a different direction. I don't know how they've done it, but DEI definitely brings the best out of the AI. The balance of it makes it so that the typical AI faction will raise about two full stacks for one region, which is actually a perfect size to make it challenging to fight city-states. Then, for my estimation, it seems like the AI can field about one stack army for every one to two towns they take from then on. So, some of my complaints with the recent DLC or with recent Total War games is that there's often barely any armies to fight on the map, just empty garrisons or one or two big battles here and there throughout your campaign. 
In DEI, there's constantly a flow of armies coming from enemy territories that match up really well with your replenishment rates, so you really need to outsmart the enemy and beat them in significant battles to turn the tide, else they'll just raise a new one by the time you heal up. I, like most people, don't really form alliances or client states in Rome too because you want to have all your province, you know, together to keep the culture good, but in DEI, the allies actually move against your enemies, which really makes them useful buffer nations, and client states pay a considerable amount of money, and usually will make two armies to defend their territories. So in my campaign, I was at war with Syracuse, but instead of taking their town, which would have meant eventually fighting Carthage to get that whole province, I instead liberated a new faction in their place, which gave me a new military ally that would stand as a buffer between me and Carthage instead. I did the same with Epirus, and then I got allies with Greece in general, so now I never have to worry about mainland Greece for a very long time, and I can instead focus on Gaul. This is just stuff that I've never seen in a normal Rome 2 campaign, and it makes the game so much more immersive than usual. You can liberate absolutely any region, and it'll make a region-specific faction. It's really cool. So those are the seven major features that make Divide et Impera the best Total War mod that has come out in the last five years. When combining population with supply with area of recruitment, more varied and immersive battles, and more interesting and dynamic characters, and an AI that actually plays the game pretty well and challenges the player, the game is really elevated to something much more special. And as many who follow me on Twitch know, our head-to-head -head with Jackie Fish is one of the best Total War campaigns I've ever played, and we'll definitely be doing another one after this, which I'll probably try and document on YouTube. Okay guys, that's it for the video. Please make sure to leave a like on the video if you want to see more from DEI or Rome 2 in general. I've got some ideas about things I could do, and your support will help me decide that. And also make sure you guys give support to Dresden and his team in whatever way you can. He's a very humble guy who honestly deserves much more recognition within the community. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.